It seems like a little bit, a bit of a stretch to go from Jesus, friend of sinners, to born to be wild, but it's really not um, when you think about it, because there's never been a wilder guy on the planet than the Son of God, Jesus Christ, and that's what we've got to remember tonight. You know, I think somehow we got him in that picture in the Sunday school room at the church. I don't know if you grew up in church, but I did, and uh, we had these inspiring portraits in the Sunday school classes we met in, you know, which was really wild, and they were... It was the oval frame. Anybody ever seen this portrait? The oval frame with the little gold wooden thing around it, and Jesus is in it. And he looks like, you know, the, uh, I mean, he just looks so tame, you know. It looks like he was, you know, all right, and, and he was in the right light, and the guy's painting him for a long time, and got this nice little thing going on. And I'm like, hello, this is the Son of God, born into earth who lived this completely untamable life. He never walked to the beat of the drum. He always was set in his own pace. He was always on his own timetable. He was always listening to the Father, showing up when the Father wanted him to, saying what the Father wanted to say. At the last week of his life, he goes into Jerusalem in the middle of this big feast, goes right in the temple and literally turns over all the tables of the money changers in the temple. That's not that guy in the frame. I mean, this guy is like yelling and screaming, get out of this place. You have turned my father's house into a den of thieves and it's supposed to be a, a house of prayer and then he goes out and lets people arrest him and is crucified and hangs and dies out in the wide open public I mean that's a that's a pretty wild life he only made it to 33 and went out in a blaze of glory and his legacy and the part of the story of God that he played is the most important thing that's ever happened on planet earth and his story his 33 year story some of you have lived longer on earth already than he did but his story and his part of his father's story has left a legacy that has shaped the earth and shaped eternity and impacted my life in fact is the most important thing about my life and there's something about getting it right all over again, and it is this, that God is wild and he's inviting us into a wild relationship with him to live wild, untamable lives on this earth. And to, to, to use an overused phrase, to go out in a blaze of glory and to leave a legacy on this planet that's a part of his story. I think one of the reasons when we get confused in our lives. And trust me, I, I'm perpetually, perpetually asking the questions, is it, is it this thing or this thing? Am I supposed to go and be a part of this deal or this deal? Is it, is it A or is it B? Is it today? Is it tomorrow? And, and all of us live with that. We carry around a, 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 an, an all-the-time factoring of all these variables in our lives. Uh, you know, am I supposed to be in this job or am I supposed to go back to grad school? I'm in grad school. I'm in the right program. I, I think I'm in the right program. Do I, do I need to come for more stuff? You know, we're always in that sort of factoring in all these variables mode. And I think it, at the heart of it all, somehow God is wanting to say to us tonight, look, here, here's the deal. It's not so much about what am I trying to say about your story, Louis. And I'm so concerned about my story. How's my story going to go? How's my story going to end? Is my, my next chapter going to look like I think it's going to look like? Is, is he in my next chapter? Is, is she in the next chapter? Is, is marriage in the next chapter? Or is a family in the next chapter? Is this job in the next chapter? Is this city in the next chapter? We're, we're, we're really concerned about our story. And, and trust me, before we finish these few weeks together, you're going to know God's really into your story. But, but we sometimes are so into our story and wanting to get God into our story to know how our story is going to end. And tonight I just want to start on an obvious point, and that is to say, look, God is interested in my story and your story, but what God is really interested in is God's story. And God has a story. He's been about it since the beginning of the creation. He has an idea in mind. He has a plan in mind. He has a will, if you will, because we're always asking, what's God's will? You know, well, we know he has one. We know he must have a purpose. We know he must have an agenda and a plan. And his story is the story. And what I want us to leave here tonight knowing more than anything else is that God is inviting us into his story. 
He's letting us in on His story and letting us be a part of His story. We will not play a role in His story as powerful as the role His Son played in His story. He played the ultimate role in the story of God. But we have a role to play in God's story, in playing our role in God's story is God's will for our life. And so the question then rolls quickly after that. Well, I don't know what my role is in God's story. Well, it's going to be easy as we start looking at God's story to see how our hearts line up with where we fit in with God's story. But it works better when we know we've been invited into His story. Then we're always in that sort of reverse equation saying, God, I want to get you into my story. These are, these are the things I'm dealing with. This is how I want you to get involved. This is the pieces I need you to move and change. These are the people I need you to get rid of. These are the people I need you to get in here. This is the ending I'm hoping to have. No, it doesn't look like we're going to this ending. I need you to change endings here. You know, we're always trying to say, God, I need you to get in my story so that my story will end up right. And God's going, look, I already have a story. And what I'm inviting you to is to take your life and to put your life in my story and let your life be about my ending, which I've already decided what it is and I already know what it is. It's not a mystery to anybody. And let your life be a part of what my values are. They're not a mystery to anybody. To let your part, life be a part of my agenda, it's clear as, as a bell. And at the end of the day, for us to know, wow, my life has a destiny and a purpose in the story of God. And when we start there, this whole thing start, starts to open up a little bit more. It doesn't mean that after five or six weeks together, you're going to go, you know what? I know everything thing I'm supposed to do in life, thank you very much, and it's all settled for me. It doesn't mean that. It just means that the, the weight, I think, is going to lift off of us. That thing that we carry, which is I'm making the right choice, or did I do the right thing, or what if I mess up, or what if I take the wrong job? You know, if I take the wrong job, I'll mess the whole world up, because, you know, have you ever gotten that mental thing, you know, like somebody else was supposed to have that job, and it was God's will, but I accidentally made the wrong decision and took their job, and so now they have to go take another job, which was somebody else's job, and I'm responsible for a whole line of people being in the wrong job? Have you ever thought about that? It's pressure. You know, I'm, I, I got to marry the right person. What if I marry the wrong person? Well, A, that's bad for me because I just married the wrong person. So now I'm stuck with the wrong person, but now I feel guilty on top of that because the person I was supposed to marry is either going to have to be single all their life or they're going to have to marry the wrong person or at least a secondary person who could be a right person but not me because I married the wrong person. So now they're married to this secondary person who's like they got the consolation prize and the person that they were supposed to marry now has to go. And I have set off a chain reaction of unhappy marriages. I mean, maybe someone in the building here is responsible for tens of thousands of unhappy marriages somewhere in the world because the dominoes started with you. I mean, that's a lot of weight, you know. It's a lot of pressure. And I think most of that pressure comes by the taming of society, which says you got to grow up you got to finish high school and you got to go to college and you got to get a degree and you have to get a good job and meet a nice girl and you have to settle down in a nice home and you have to have a, the, the normal family and you have to get involved in all the things that we do in America and that's what life looks like and that's the taming of the wild heart that God has birthed in us who's saying, you know what, it might be 75 years in the suburbs or it might be 31 and you might go out in a blaze of glory. Just make sure you're in my story. And somehow in shifting that, I think the weight lifts off of us and we, we realize we're not down here just trying to figure something out, but we have God involved in our lives and he's invited us into his life. And if God is in the equation, thank you very much, everything's gonna be fine if God is in the equation. We're not going to marry the wrong person if God is in the equation. We're not going to take the wrong job if God's in the equation. We're not going to the wrong grad school for crying out loud if God is in our equation. That he's not going to let us do that. Our hope is in him. In the very first pages of the Bible, I just want us to look at a couple of passages tonight. It's amazing how this starts, this whole thing started. And I know you know this already, and I know this already, but it helps me tonight to remember it, and I hope it will you as well. First page of the Bible would be a good place to start with discovering what God's will and purpose for our lives is so that we can know and embrace that. And look at the very first page of the Bible. I like that. It doesn't matter what kind of translation you have. Just turn to the first page, and we'll all be together. It says this in verse 26 of the first chapter. 
Then God said, now this is after God has made an incredible creation which just blows my mind. God said, let us, who's the us there? Father, Son, Holy Spirit, this triune God we worship. Let us make man in our image. Let's make a man and let's make him in our image. Now let me ask you a question. Do you think God's wild at heart? Do you think God's wild of spirit? Do you think God is like totally tame or do you think God is like way out there? When I say wild, I'm not, when I say born to be wild tonight, some of you will praise God I came tonight because uh, that's me. You know? In fact, I'm leaving here tonight and going to party a little bit. That's me. I'm not talking about that kind of wild. Some of you are, are, are wild, out of control wild, like your, your life's out of control, your finances are out of control, your relationships are out of control, your temper's out of control, your appetites are out of control. It's just like craziness all the time. I'm not talking about that kind of wild. I'm talking about full life wild. I'm talking about getting your money's worth. I'm talking about going out in a blaze of glory. I'm talking about living life to the max and never settling for existing. Never shrinking into the gravity of our earth and saying, you know what, all I care about is whether TiVo got the right show or whether you know, everything's working okay in my life or my job's going all right or well, blah. And all of a sudden our life just starts shrinking down to this little bitty thing that doesn't resemble what God had in mind. It's the kind of wild that's even more than the thrill seekers that are here. Some of you would say, man, I can't, I, I, you chalk me up. I'm not one of those sit around, hang out guys. I skydive. I've, I've, you know, dived with sharks. I've climbed mountains. I've been to the continents. I'm wild, you know. Well, that's cool. I like that. That's a cool kind of thing. As opposed to saying, you know, I know my way around Alpharetta and that's about it, you know, for me. <laughs> but all that stuff is going to be gone at the end. All the things we've done and the places we've gone. There are other people that have that sort of makeup to say, I just want to get all I can. And you're going for it. You're that overdrive person. And you're, you're just amassing whatever you can in terms of position or power or things. I'm not talking about that kind of wild. I'm not talking about that kind of life to the max. I'm talking about experience to the max. Going to do it all, see it all, be there for it all, and come back and do it all over again. All that stuff goes away. I'm talking about living our lives with eternal purpose and investing them in eternal things and spending every ounce of us on stuff that lasts forever. How do you do that? Get in God's story and let Him use your life in the flow of his story. That's what's going on here. That's what he was thinking when he said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness, he said, so they can rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and the livestock and over all the earth and all the creatures that move along the ground. But God said, I want to make him in our image. So the next verse 27, so God created man in his own image, in the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And so when we start tonight, I, I'm just saying obvious things that somehow get squashed out by the life that we live in culture. And the obvious thing is that we're created by God and stamped in the very likeness and image of God. And he's wild as God is. I've been into the cosmos. I, I, I'm just into it. I, I know nobody else is, but um, bless me. You know, I, I love astronomy. I, I love seeing what God has made. It just helps me go, ah, uh, you know, and just remember how big God is. I was really getting into the sun the last couple of weeks. You know the sun, you know which I'm talking about. It's the big star in our solar system. Um, it's not the biggest star, by the way. It's just an average star. You know there are a couple billion stars in our solar system, just our solar system, our little cosmic neighborhood, which the sun is just one of. It's an average star in our solar system. I'm thinking it's a pretty cool star, but it ain't like a big deal star. Like when they rank all the stars of the solar system and talk about them, it's not like, ooh, the sun. The sun's like a mediocre, run-of-the-mill star in our solar system, of which there are billions of stars. It's 94 million miles away from here. Can you get your head around that? I can't. That's a long way. But check this out. It's so, it's so hot. I think you already knew that. And you're like, oh, thank you, Louie. I appreciate that. <laughs> That's why we have sunscreen. We know it's hot. Check it out. When, when, when heat and light leave the sun, it only takes it eight minutes to touch your face. Eight minutes. 94 million miles. See, this is why I'm a loner in this astronomy thing. Everybody's like, all right, cool, right on, bro. Appreciate it. <laughs> I mean, just think about that. 
Maybe you don't want to think about it. I, I just am like, what? Every second. I mean, you know the sun is big. It's powerful. It's, it's huge. Every second on the sun, the energy that the sun creates that goes out at such a high speed and in eight minutes touches me down here in, in Georgia. 94 million miles. Eight minutes. Woo, it's warm. That's a big thing. That's a big ball of heat. Every second the sun is giving off energy equivalent to, this will bless you, equivalent to 92 billion nuclear bombs going off every single second. Now, I've never seen one nuclear bomb go off. I mean, I saw the pictures of the one that went off a while back, but we hadn't seen that in our lifetime. But, but imagine 92 nuclear bombs going off, okay? Imagine 92 billion nuclear bombs going off. Boom! Boom! <laughs> Boom! You don't want to be around the sun. It is a violent place. It is, a, it is an intense place. There is a lot of noise happening at the sun. There's a lot of energy being blown off at the sun. And it's doing that every second. Like, I mean, all night when we've been in here, kaboom! <laughs> Kaboom, 92 billion nuclear bombs. Kaboom, 92 billion more. Kaboom, get 92 billion more ready. Kaboom, get 92 billion more ready. Kaboom, kaboom. And it's like an average star in our neighborhood, which is only one of billions of galaxies in the cosmos as we know it. And you know God's up there laughing. He, he, we have no clue what's really out there. And God, that God who made that one star, made you like him. He did not make you to be tame and normal American Western somebody who has a job and has a thing and does a deal and eventually dies and have a little service and that's you. Now see that's if you were made in the image of like you know some little bitty I think I'll make somebody and I'll let them have something and they'll go to work somewhere and they'll have a roommate and they'll get married down here and God's like, do you know who I am? And when I made you, you, I made you like me. I put some of me in you. I stamped some of me inside of you. So that thing that's inside of you that every now and then kind of jars itself awake and says, wait a minute. I don't want to just have a bunch of money. I don't want to just have a good job. I don't want to just go see everything in the world. I don't want to just have all the experiences you can have in life. I, I want my life to count for something. That's the image of God inside of us. A, a crazy God, a wild God, a full-on God, a life-to-the-max kind of God. And that's what he wants for you, and that's what he wants for me. He describes this a little bit more in the next chapter. This will blow your mind, knowing that he's this big, huge creator God. Apparently, he was standing down in the Garden of Eden when he made all this stuff. He finally made it all, made that sun we just talked about and a billion other stars like it and the earth and everything in the earth. And finally, when he was done, look what it says in verse 7 of chapter 2. The Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground. So he's scraping up dirt, okay, and making this guy. That, you you got to love that. you gotta, you got to love that right there. He's just scraping up dirt for legs and feet and a, and a chest and arms and a head and he's putting this guy together out of the dirt of the earth and then if that's not amazing enough he's got this guy now he's got Adam there out of dirt and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and the man became a living being. Okay, that's cool. When Adam woke up, God had just had his mouth on him, on his nose. And he's looking up at the creator of the world. He said, well, what did God look like in the garden? Who knows? How could God, who could make a son like our son, be standing in the Garden of Eden? I, I, I don't know. But we know sin hadn't entered the equation. We know that Adam was perfect and made in the image of God. 
And when he looked up, he was looking up at the face of the creator of the entire world. And when he breathed out the first breath, which was an exhale, the air that went out of him was the air that had come into him from God himself. And he breathed out the very breath of God and woke up and was a living being ignited by the very breath of God. Now maybe you weren't the first man. I know I wasn't the first man. But Psalm 139 makes it clear that God is still in the forming business and he's still in the life-giving business. And every one of us in this building tonight, we are in the building tonight because God formed us and breathed into us the breath of life and we became a living being. Not an existing being, but a living being. Not just somebody trying to, you know, survive life on earth, but a living being made in the image of this incredible, powerful, supernatural, awe-inspiring, uncontrollable, uncontainable, never-ending, powerful God. And the very breath that we breathe was the breath of God. And what that says to us is there is a destiny for our lives that we are not the product of circumstances, we're not the product of family, we're not just the product of decisions that a mother made and a father made, we're not just the product of our upbringing, but we are destiny bound. We are people made in God's image, breathed into by the very breath of God to join the story of God. So when, when Adam woke up, he didn't say, hey God, what's your, what's your will for my life? When he woke up, he was in relationship with God, a God who already had a cool story going. God could tell Adam when he woke up, hey, guess what I've been doing for the last six days? Well, I made sun, I made night, I made the stars, I made the planets, I made the universe, I made the earth, I made water, I made trees, I made birds. Check out these birds I made, Adam. I made 5,000 kinds of birds. I'll tell you all about them. And so he told him all about the birds, and I made all of these, and I made this, and I made this. God already had a story going. You see what I'm saying? And so when Adam woke up, it wasn't like, all right, God, I'm here. What's your will for my life? It, it was like, when he woke up, it was like, I have a story going, Adam, and I'm going to put you in my story. You're going to be the guy who takes care of the stuff I just made. I'm going to just put you right in my story. And that's where purpose is going to come from for your life, to be in my story. Well, very quickly after that, you know how this story went downhill in a hurry. Adam and Eve disobeyed God. Their, their pride got ahead of his godness, their, their own lust for being like him, their deceptive you know, sway. They, they, they sinned against God and were expelled from the garden, and, and they were cut off from fellowship with God. Imagine that. God got breathed into his nose, his first breath from God, and now he's cut off from God when he was cut off from God everything got confusing and we don't know where to go live we don't, we're not sure what to do we're not sure how to get along with people we're not, we, we're not really confident anymore about the decisions we're making we're perplexed about things and we're susceptible to all kinds of to, to lies and all kinds of stuff in our lives and, and everything got real cloudy at that point except the story of God and the story of God didn't change his story all along was to create a people that would sing his praise and glorify him in the whole earth and even though sin came in to the beginning part of that story his story kept going right on until it came to the son of God and God just kept going right on connecting people back to him and bringing the nations to be a people who know that they were created by God to worship God. And that's the story of God and it's happening tonight all over the world. It started there and it's going to go on till its conclusion and at some point God's saying to you, no, by the way, and you go, and he says, hi, I'm God and I have a story going on. I'd like you to be in my story. And being in his story 
is about life to the full. Jesus said it in a way that most of you know. You've heard this verse in John 10. It's an incredible story he's telling, and we're going to look at it in a little more detail next week. He's talking about the relationship of God and the people he loves, and he's using a picture of a shepherd and, and a flock to a shepherd and sheep, and, he's, and that's kind of a tender picture, which is really kind of cool. But and I'll read a little bit for context. But in verse 7, Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth, I am the gate for the sheep. All who ever came before me, they were thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the gate. In other words, I'm the one who guards, cares for, takes care of, and, and is the, the keeper of these sheep. Whoever enters through me will be saved. He will come in and out and find pasture. In other words, there's a whole, there's a whole promise for satisfaction of life right there. As long as he's our shepherd, the son of God, we're going to come in and out of the pen. We're going to know how to go in and out of the gate. And we're going to find pasture for our lives. And that's all sheep really want to do is find pasture. They just want to be in a pasture. And if they're in a pasture, they're happy. He said, you're going to be fine because I'm going to lead you in and out and you're going to find pasture. He said, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. But look what Jesus said. I have come. In other words, I'm in the story of God. I've joined God's story here on earth. Started at the garden. Things went wrong, but God's story is still going on. That's why I'm here, and I've come. Listen to what he said. That they might have life and have it to the full. That's that little phrase that we love about Jesus. He said, I've come that you might have life, not just existence. I didn't come for that. I came that you might have life and life to the full. I've come that you would max it out. I've come for something wild, something crazy, something adventurous, something that's off the chart, something that looks like me and looks like my father. And I've come to give that to you and lead you into that. Like a shepherd, I've come to lead you to a full life. I haven't come to point out, shepherds don't point to sheep. Oh, by the way, the pasture's down there. Just go follow that little creek bed, and you're going to see a little opening, and go through that opening, and up over that one little hill, you're going to find a great pasture back there. Sheep, just, they, well, for one thing, they can't see, so sheep hear. That's why shepherds go along and call the sheep, and when they call them, the sheep are like, all right, cool, we'll come along. That's because they can't see good. And he says, these sheep follow me, he goes on to say. They hear my voice. They know me. What he was trying to say was, I, I'm going to be with you, and I'm going to lead you to life, to fullness of life. I'm not going to point you towards life. I'm going to lead you to life. I'm going to be with you, giving you life. I'm going to be in the midst of the life with you. So Jesus, he meets this guy named Peter. Because some of you are thinking, you know, okay, that's cool. I want to, I'm, great, I'm in God's story. I want to be in God's story. Cool. But just check this out. Now, you got to love this. Peter is fishing with his... Um, with his business, that's what he always does. Jesus comes along and says, okay, guys, um, I want you to follow me. And Peter says, okay, and he leaves his family business and he goes and follows Jesus. Have you ever thought about doing something crazy like that? You know, your parents were really thrilled. You know, they always thought you were going to do the insurance business. You know, that's the family thing. And you went and said, you know what, Dad, guess what? I'm moving to, you know, Bulgaria and uh, I'm going to, you know, start selling stuff on the streets. And they're like, great, you know, cool. I mean, he just leaves the family business. Like, goodbye, Dad. Goodbye, fishing. Goodbye, family. Goodbye, home. I'm going with this Jesus guy because there's something about him that grabbed my heart. There's something wild about this guy that invited me in. There's something about him when he said, come on and follow me. I went, okay, I'm following following you. Bye. I'm following him. And for three years, he followed Jesus around all over. They didn't have a home. They didn't have like a, an organization. Can you imagine how weird those family reunions were when he was back at home or when he was writing letters back home or get letters from his parents like, what are you doing with your life? Well, we're basically just hanging around. We went down to Bethany and then we went back down here. Then we've come back around the lake and we did this thing on the lake one day. And we went on a boat. That was really cool. And I mean, we've just been around and we've been seeing stuff and doing stuff. And they're like, what are you doing with your life? Hello? For three years, they're just wandering around. They're not sure what the plan is. Ultimately, they don't know what the outcome's going to be. They don't know what the payoff is. They don't know what the blueprint looks like. The guy just said, follow us, and we've been following him, and trust me, it is a pretty wild ride. We went to this wedding, boom, wine. We, it, and everybody was flipped out. We, one day, we were out on the lake, and I just got out of the boat and started walking out on the water. Amazing stuff. I'm going to keep following the guy. Well, I mean, I did sink. Yeah, you know, a couple of the other guys chime in. Yeah, and I remember when you, you went down, and he had to reach out there and grab you? Yeah. Yeah, cool, but I was walking for a while. For three years, that's the story. We don't know what the ending is. We don't know where this thing goes. We don't know. We don't, we're just going with it. And then a huge left turn. So they're praying one night, men come to arrest the guy whose magnetism 
called them away from home, family, all the things they knew, business and everything else, and all of a sudden, soldiers come in and take Jesus and arrest him. And Peter, of course, is like, whoa, this isn't in the plan. This is not in my story, hello. I didn't follow the guy around for three years to have you guys come in here and rough him up in the garden in the middle of the night in the Passover season. And so he just takes out his sword, just goes at the first guy he can get to, like, hello. He starts writing his own story. Whack! He goes for this guy's head. He's just going to chop the guy's head off. Imagine, you know, the domino effects of that in the will of God. He's just taking this guy out, guy is a little quick, dodges, whew, takes an ear off. And he's, he turns around to Jesus like, all right, come on, guys, let's go, let's kill him. And Jesus is like, whoa, time out. Takes the guy's ear, puts it back on his head. <laughs> That's why they've been following him for three years. That's wild. That's not tame. Well, what'd y'all do last night? Well, I don't know, we had the Passover feast, and then we just went back to a quiet evening at the house, and, you know, it was cool. What would y'all do? Man, we were down in the garden and people came in in the night to try to take Jesus. I went after one of them, a big, huge dude. Big dude. I just went after him and I mean, cut his left ear right off of his head. People are like, what? And then what happened? Jesus picked his ear up, put it back on his head. Okay, that's wild. But it was a left turn for Peter because Jesus let him take him that night and they arrested him and they put him in a jail and he was hours away from dying. And when it all came down, and I mean just in the twinkling of an eye, when it all came down, and it came down fast, a kid pressed Peter up against the wall and said, you go with him, don't you? And he said, expletive, 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 I don't know what you're talking about. I've never heard of the Son of God. I don't know anybody named Jesus of Nazareth. No, I'm not with him. And when the sun came up, the Son of God was crucified. Not so much for the three years of my life, I followed that guy around. But this is a wild guy. And on Sunday, word got back to Peter and he and John ran to an empty tomb and stuck their head inside and there were grave clothes in there like they'd been wrapped around somebody but they were hollow like a cocoon because when Jesus got raised from the dead he didn't bother unwrapping the stuff he just got out like that <laughs> and they saw them and flipped out wild story and eventually Jesus appeared to him and Peter of course is like oh, great this ain't gonna go good and Jesus said, hey, I know you love me, don't you? I do. I don't know what I was telling that kid, but you know I love you. I've been with you for three years. You know I'm into this thing. You know I believe in who you are. I was the one who said you're the Christ, son of the living God. Remember, I'm that guy. I'm Peter. And you said on me you're going to build a church, which I don't know how a good idea that was. But I was that guy, and I do love you. And Jesus said, I know you love me. And then, of all things, after this guy who's come out of the tomb, wild, decides he's leaving. And he leaves. He leaves Peter. It's right when the story's getting good again. We got a great story now. We had a big left turn, big disappointment, but we had a big redemption moment, and now you're here with nails in your hands and in your feet. This is powerful. This is a pretty big witness. Like, we don't have to preach real long when we have the services, you know. You just walk out and people go, okay. You know, I mean, this is going good right now, you know. And then Jesus says, I'm leaving. What kind of story is that? It's a wild story. He says, yeah, don't worry, though. When I leave, something better is going to happen. I'm like, what could be better than this? This is the greatest thing's ever gone. We've never seen anybody put ears back on people before. This is a wild story. No, it's going to get better. And they're praying in Jerusalem. And the Holy Spirit fell on them. Peter and the followers, they were filled with the Holy Spirit. The building shook. Sunlight came fast. It's like fire came out of heaven. And tongues of fire fell on the building. And it was shaken. And the Holy Spirit came on them. They went, whoa, something just happened to us. God, God inside of them it wasn't just Jesus walking around with them it was God inside of them and they were transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit and Peter went and started preaching and proclaiming and building the church and thousands upon thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people were trusting Jesus every day it was a revolution. It was, it was unbelievable. It was a story. It was wild. It was like, whoo! We went and preached and thousands of people got saved. I mean, that was a big deal. I mean, people were coming to Peter and they were going, dude, you are God. 
Because he just would walk by people and his shadow would touch them and they would be healed. And they're like... You're like, ooh. That's a cool story. That's where I want to get to, Louie. That's what I'm talking. That's what I'm here for. Get me there. And there for Peter meant one of the key builders of what we're all a part of tonight. And Forty went to jail. And Forty was persecuted. And his story ended with him being crucified like Jesus, but upside down as, a, as an insult to the Christ he proclaimed. That was his life. And you're like, oh... Every time this story gets going good, it flips around some weird way. There's one last part about Peter's story, and it's called a legacy. A life that didn't end and that changed the world. You say, well, Louis, thank you very much. If I'd been one of the 12 disciples, I'm sure I would have a pretty cool story too. You would. Except for all of them, but one died martyrs' deaths and the other one died in prison for his faith. You see, the story isn't always the way we think it's going to go. And it's certainly not the taming of the heart like we've done in our culture. To dial everything down to this little bitty existence, which can I just say this because I'm in it with you guys. For the most part, a whole bunch of it is just flat, pointless, and meaningless, and we act like it's the most important thing in the world. And God has said, Don't you know I breathed into you the breath of life? And I created you for a destiny and a purpose that your life would never end and it would be eternal, that you would have a legacy at the end of your life. Maybe your life ends up on a cross upside down. I don't think any of us are probably going to be martyred for our faith. I'm, I'm just using that as an analogy. Maybe the life takes a big left turn. Maybe there's a big disappointment. Maybe there's a big redemption moment. But God doesn't care. Circumstances won't stop him from the destiny he has for your life. There's no, nothing in your past that's going to disqualify you from having a life that counts and a legacy. You say, Louis, I, I, I'm already out of that because of this, this, and the other. Hello, God's not bound by our circumstances. He's not bound by our failures. He's not bound by our family family situation. He's not bound by our makeup, by our sociology, by our, by our ethnicity, by our past in any way, shape, or form. He's breathed into us the breath of life. He can supersede everything and starting in this moment tonight can begin to put us on a path of destiny and put you on a path of destiny for your life to count. I'll tell you about one other guy and I want to close tonight. This guy, I love this guy. He's one of my favorite people in American history. George Washington Carver. Everybody got something for free tonight. We got the sun 94 million miles away from the earth. Try to get that into conversation tomorrow. We got George Washington Carver. Do you know this guy? Unbelievable guy. Thank God for this guy. He was born in the late 1800s. His father died right before he was born. He was born into slavery. His father died right before he was born. Soon after he was born, slave raiders came and kidnapped he and his mother from the plantation they were on. They somehow recovered him, but they never found his mother. Brought him back to the plantation. He grew up sickly and weak. They didn't think the kid was going to make it year after year after year when he was little. Could never work in the fields when he got older because he was too weak, so he always stayed in the house. Turns out the guy was brilliant. He was an amazing painter. Had works displayed at one of the world's fairs. Amazing piano player. But he had this certain knack for horticulture. You're like, oh man. Woo. He just had it. He went to Iowa State University. I think he might have been the first African American that went to Iowa State. I don't know that part for sure, but I know he went to Iowa State University, got a degree, eventually was invited by Booker T. Washington to come and teach at Tuskegee Institute in Alabama. And he was an agricultural wizard and a man of God. He was such a simple man of God. They, they would find in his top dresser drawer at his house like six months worth of paychecks just in the top drawer. He just lived a simple life, just trusted God. He was ahead of one of the Christian organizations on school as a faculty advisor. Cool guy. He was in the passion movement before we even had one. I like this guy. 
And George Washington Carver would go and sit in the woods and have a devotion with God. You got a guy, check this out, who's an agricultural professor. Whoop to do. Who's a black man in a time where that wasn't the biggest platform on earth in this country. Who's at Tuskegee Institute in Alabama. And he's having a devotion with God. And he would often go out into the woods. Why? Because he loved horticulture. He loved the woods. He loved plants. He loved stuff. He's sitting on a little stump he sat on in the woods. You've got to love this. Because you're thinking you're in some little cubicle like ho-hum, you know. Or you're at a stage of life where it ain't going on. Or you're someplace where God's forgotten about you. Or your story's gotten real slow and uninteresting. And maybe you don't even have a story at all going on right now. He's sitting out on a stump in the woods with God. And he says to God, this is him in his biography, God, could you just tell me how you made the world? Well, I'm thinking. And he said he felt like the Lord was saying back to him, George, if I told you how I made the world, you, you couldn't understand. He said, okay, God, then could you just tell me how you made me? He's like, dude, I'm, I'm paraphrasing. If I, if I told you... <laughs> If I told you how I made you, you, you couldn't understand that. And so in frustration, he records. So he says to God, okay then, can you just tell me something about a peanut? All right, I can't get the world too big. All right, fine. I can't get me, human complexity, too big for me, fine. Okay, God, can you just tell me something about a peanut? Now, he, he, he wasn't expecting anything about the peanut. You understand the story so far? He just was frustrated. But he records that he felt like he came under the, the unction of the Spirit of God. And he went to his laboratory. And for 48 hours, George Washington Carver did not emerge from his laboratory, did not eat or sleep. And not just the end of those 48 hours, but at the end of the process of life, okay, you ready for this? George Washington Carver came up with 325 patented products that are used all over the world right now that all come from peanuts. He opened up the mystery of the peanut and changed the economy of nations. He changed the economy of continents. He, I mean, applied materials, metals, um, all kind of products, dairy products, all kind of substitute products, all kind of food products, all kind of shelter building making products. He unlocked the mystery of the peanut long before Jimmy Carter even came along. He was the peanut guy. He opened it up. 325 patented products that all come. He revolutionized agriculture and opened a whole peanut industry from sitting out on a stump with God in the woods going, okay, God, backhanded remark, not really expecting an answer. You know, just thinking, ho-hum, sitting out here again in my agriculture job here at the university with God. All right, can you just tell me something about a peanut? God said, oh, yeah, I can tell you a whole lot about a peanut, man. You got time to learn about a peanut. Let me open up the peanut to you, George Washington Carver. You're going to change the world because of the peanut. And God, when he got three, wasn't tired. He's like, somebody want to ask me about a cashew? <laughs> That's what Jesus had in mind when he said, I've come that you might have life. I don't mean just like eternal life so that when you die you know that you keep living with me in the spirit. That's, that is huge. But I mean life, life, so that while you're alive on earth you know that you're alive on earth. And if it's 30 years or 70 years, you don't care. You just want to go out in a blaze of glory. And I don't know what cubicle you sit in. I don't know what classroom you study in, what dorm room you live in. I don't know what neighborhood you live in, what kind of family situation you've got going on right now. I don't know what all of your limitations, variables, and circumstances are, but I know God, if you, if you are coming to, to awaken to the reality that He made you and wants to be a part of your life, I know God, if He's in the equation, you could ask God about what you do at your job and He could blow your mind. You're like, my job is a peanut, Louie. I work in a peanut factory. <laughs> and God's going, 
Just ask me. Ask me. I hate these peanuts. <laughs> Twelve, thirteen. Thirteen peanuts. They all look good. Second batch of peanuts look good. Peanuts got shipped to Peoria on time. Oops, Peoria people didn't like the peanuts. Or marketing meeting about peanuts for Peoria. A new peanuts going to Peoria. And God's like, you know what? You're in the wrong story. You're in your story. And you need to jump into my story. In fact, I'm inviting you into my story. I'll take you from whatever job you're in. I'll take you from whatever circumstance you're in. I'll take you wherever you work. I'll take you wherever you live. I'll take you wherever you are right now. And I will use you to build a legacy in my story. If you'll let me. You were born to be wild. Not tame. Not careful, not controlled, not settled, not careful. You were born to be wild. <laughs> you understand what I mean? And we want to talk about how to open those doors in these next few weeks. And put flesh on that skeleton. So that in a few weeks we can step ahead together and go, I am in God's will for my life. And that's a possibility for every one of us in the midst of this whole deal.